Well, if you missed some of that excitement, that's the last couple of weeks we had kids camp here at our campus and also at the Heights and Monument campus. And let me just say, for all of those of you who are helped, thank you. Just a wonderful opportunity to share the love of God with kids. Um, upwards of a thousand kids participated across those campuses. So, yes, thank you. My name is Jim. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Woodman, and we are so happy to have you here. If tonight is one of the first times you've ever been here, we would love to um, just have a moment to chat with you. There are some really friendly people just out through those center doors and to the left. So at the end of service, there's an area called Connect Central. We'd love for you to stop by there and, and have an opportunity to be greeted. Um, just want to acknowledge, too, this is... Um, Independence Day weekend, right? It's on Tuesday that we have um, 4th of July. We celebrate our independence and the freedoms that that brings, and we're, we're thankful for that, absolutely. Not any question, it's a, it's a blessing to us. Um, as you prepare for the service, there's a QR code on the back of the pew in front of you. Feel free to scan that. That'll give you a sense of what's taking place, It'll give you the um, songs for this evening and things like that. But for right now, hey, let's all stand and with all our hearts and all our voices, join in worship. We're going to praise and worship Jesus for who he is and for what he's done. So let's sing, there's a Savior. There is a Savior.
be together tonight to gather, to worship and declare out loud that Jesus Christ is our Savior and that Jesus Christ is the reason for our joy. Amen? Amen. Well, if we haven't gotten to meet, my name is Casey, and this is Brent, and this is one of our summer interns, Liam, and it's a, a joy and a privilege to get to help lead this time of worship of God's people tonight. And as we were singing that last song, it reminded me of the first time that I put my trust and my hope in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and it was over 20 years ago, which is crazy to even think about right now. And don't start trying to figure out how old I am. That doesn't work that way. But um, I, I just thank you, Jesus. When I think of who I was before I met him and how he has saved me from myself, from my sin, from the evil ways of this world, and how he has shown me his goodness and his mercy and his faithfulness and that his ways are better, man, it just makes me want to sing out and say, Jesus, thank you. We love you. I love you. I praise you. I worship you for you are God. And so tonight in this room, surely there are a few of us maybe um, who are new, new to Jesus, maybe just visiting with a friend and so if, you're, if you don't know who Jesus is, we're so glad that you're here and we invite you to come and, and see who he is and learn about this God that we're singing to tonight. But I know that there are many in this room who can, who can think about that, that time when they put their faith and their trust in Jesus and who can reflect on their lives and remember who he has been to them and who he is and all he's done. And so church, this is the time that we get to come together each week and to sing out our gratitude and our worship to him because he's worthy of it and remind ourselves and remind one another of all that he's done. So let's continue to sing, let's worship, and let's pour out our praise. Amen? Let's sing together.
love you. We are so thankful that we get to have this time of worship together. For this encouragement, Lord, I pray that you not only encourage our hearts tonight, but that we can take it with us this week. Lord, as we continue in worship, we're gonna take an offering, Lord. It's We're giving back to you what you've given to us. So do with it what you would. Continue to speak to our hearts and be with us in this time. We love you. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Great to see you guys, whether you're here in our uh, Rock Rimmon Auditorium or if you're at any of the, the other campuses. We're so glad that you have chosen to gather together tonight. Now, if I haven't met you yet, and there's, there's a fair amount here that I haven't met, I'm, I'm not a guest speaker, really. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here at Woodman. I've actually been here for 19 years. So, yeah, I know. Give a little perspective. A little perspective. When I started, my hair was brown. And our own Josh was still in his 20s. Just, so about five years ago, I became the campus pastor for our, our Southwest campus. Big shout out to Southwest. We're really excited about what God's doing down there. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we are starting a four-week series based on our mission statement. Now, maybe you're not familiar with our mission statement. Many of you guys know our vision statement is to love well, change lives through Christ. But the mission statement is, uh, we're going to introduce you to that if you're not familiar with it. We're calling it our core four, like the core values of what we hold at, at Woodman. And this core four is gather, connect, grow, and contribute. So gather is when we come together like now in, the, in these rooms in, in large groups, we come and we gather together to worship God, to hear his word, to spend time in in prayer to him. And then the second core value is connect, and we'll talk about that that next week. Uh, Andrew Gerhardt from our Monument Campus is going to be talking about connect. And connect is when you go from from gathering together to turning towards one another, begin to connect with each other. And sometimes uh, that can happen through affinity-based connect groups, or there's a whole ton of different ways around here to be able to start, start plugging and really connecting with other people. And then the natural progression goes from when we gather to when we connect to then when we grow deeper in our faith. And Andrew Reichert is going to be uh, from our uh, Woodman Heights campus is going to be taking us through that in a couple of weeks as we grow deeper in our faith. And the fourth core value is contribute. It's a natural progression. We gather together, we connect, we grow deeper in our faith. And as a result of that, we begin to contribute. We use our our gifts and our wiring, our personalities, our resources to give back for what God has done for us, to be able to give of our resources, of our time, our energy, to to be able to to help out in all types of areas, become ministry partners. And so today, we're going to be talking about Gather and why it is so important. And because it's so important, we'll start off with a time of prayer. Lord, I thank you so much that we, we can gather together as, uh, in freedom, Lord, that we're able to, to gather as, as a, a body of people to worship you, to praise your name, to lift your name high. And we're able to gather to hear your word, to dive deeper into your word. And we thank you for that. And Father, I thank you that we can spend time in prayer to you. We can come before you. And so, Lord, 
today as, as we look at what it means to, to gather, the things that you've called us to, Lord, I pray that we would be people that would draw near to you. Father, that we would be people that would hold fast to our hope. And Lord, that we would be people that would stir one another up to love and good deeds. And so Lord, as we just open your word, I, I pray that you would, that these would be your words, not mine. Father, that you would help me not make any mistakes and that you would open our hearts to what you would have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we are in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. So if, if you have a Bible, open it, or if you have an, an app uh, with a Bible on it, go ahead and go to Hebrews 10. We'll start in verse 19 through 25. Now the writer of Hebrews, and, and that's a whole other, there, there's a mystery there. It's not told who the writer of Hebrews is, but the writer of Hebrews is going to invite us in this section to do three things. First of all, he's going to invite us, he says, let us draw near to God. And secondly, he says, let us hold fast to our hope. And third, let us stir up one another to love and good works. So the question is, where do these three, three things happen? And in these six verses that we're looking at, he uses words like we, us, our, and one another 11 times. 11 times in six verses. These, these we, us, our, one another, these are words of gathering, words of community, words of coming together. These three things that he's inviting us to all happen as we gather together. So first of all, he invites us, he says, let us draw near, verses 19 through 22. He says, therefore, brothers. Now, there are certain words in, in scripture that we tend to just gloss over, we bounce right past, like therefore, but, the, and. These are very key words. And therefore is an important word. Anytime you see a therefore in scripture, you need to ask yourself what the therefore is therefore. Therefore always lays the foundation for where we're at now, therefore points back to something that's important to where we're at now. So here he says, therefore, brothers, what's the basis of this statement, this, this section that we're in? If we look back at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now think of the context here. Put yourself into this. You're, uh, you've grown up as an Israelite, as a Jewish person who has been steeped in the sacrificial system that has been going on for generations and generations. And they, were, they are carrying out the law. This is a commandment from God to do these sacrifices. And they would the, the priests would stand daily offering sacrifices over and over and over. And they would offer up that the animal would be killed. Their blood would be poured out for the sins of the people. But what would happen? The people would sin again. And the next day, there needs to be an offering for sin, and they would sin again. And the next day, and it would go on and on. And this is the amazing thing. He says, which can never take away sins. These sacrifices, ultimately, they, they could not take away sins. The sins kept happening over and over, and the payment needed to happen over and over. They were a constant reminder of the seriousness of sin. Verse 12, but, again, a key word, contrast. He says, they offered the same sacrifice over and over, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Where the priests were offering up sacrifices, there's actually a description in the Bible of the furniture that, that's, that's in the holy place. And one of the things, one of the pieces of furniture that's lacking is a chair. There was no chair in there because the work was never done. The priest could not sit down. He had to continually offer sacrifices over and over. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. We learn in Hebrews that, that Jesus Christ, the ultimate high priest, 
offered himself the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate holy of holies. And then he rose from the dead, he ascended to the Father, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. His last words on the cross, it is finished. He completed it. The sacrifices are done. Verse 10, or chapter 10, verse 14 says, For by a single offering he has, past tense, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So whoever these people are, those who are being sanctified, they've been perfected for all time. If you are here or you are listening to my voice and you have placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, this is you. You are those who are being sanctified. You are perfected for all time. See, this is, this is the bottom line. If you place your faith in Christ, there is no sin that is beyond his forgiveness. No sin. There's no failure that he cannot mend. There's no shame that he cannot heal. We are free. We are free to love and we are free to be loved. But do you believe that? That truth, if we believe that, that truth would change how we live in community, how we gather together. Verse 19, he says, Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. He says, Since we, we, the people of the gathering, we have confidence to enter the holy places. It's plural. There's more than one place, one, more than one holy place. There actually was two holy places in the tabernacle and in the temple. There was the holy place, and then there was a curtain that divided that from the most holy place, or the holy of holies. And the holy place was the place of ongoing sacrifices. Again, no chair in there. The work was never done. And only priests were allowed in. Not you and not me. Only the priests were allowed in to offer the sacrifices. And then the most holy place, the holy of holies, represented the very presence of God. And only one man could enter the holy of holies. And that was the high priest and only one day a year on the day of atonement. And he says that since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus... Now think about this. We, who, who could come into the presence of God? One man, one day, out of the entire nation. And now all of a sudden we, the gathered people, can come into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ has come for every single one of us. We have been separated from God because of our sin, and we can't ever be good enough to overcome that. We can't do anything to make it right. And because I couldn't come to God, God came to me. He sent his son to pay for my, my sins, every single one of them, to set me free. And Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one can boast. God has sent a son to pay for you, to pay for me. And because of that, we can be free. Verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. When Jesus died on the cross, at the moment of his death, that curtain that divided the holy place from the holy of holies was ripped in two from top to bottom. Jesus opened the curtain. He threw the door wide open. He made a way for me and for you to enter into the holy presence of God. In verse 21, he says, so he said, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God. So what is the house of God? Some people think it's, it's a building. It's some kind of edifice. It's not. It's you. It's all of us in these rooms. We are the house of God. And Jesus, the ultimate high priest, is over 
this house. So here's a question. Why are you here? Why are you in one of these auditoriums today? There's a hundred different reasons. My parents made me come. That one's got to be accompanied by an eye roll. My wife says it's important for our family, so I'm going to come. Girl says my boyfriend is cute and he wants me to come, so I'll come. Someone says I love the worship time. I just love singing. Someone else might say I want to learn the Bible. Or maybe I'm trying to figure out what this whole Christianity thing is all about. There are hundreds of reasons that people could give. But I believe that every person in each of these rooms is here for two reasons. We need God and we need people. We need God and we need people. We have gathered because we need to gather. It matters. So since we have confidence to come before God himself, and since Jesus is a high priest over the house of God, his church, verse 22, let us draw near with a, full, a true heart and full assurance of faith. So because the perfect high priest has offered the perfect sacrifice that opened the curtain to the very presence of God, we can draw near to God. Do you have a full assurance of faith that you, with confidence, can draw near to God? The curtain's been opened up, but are you willing to come into his presence? And if not, what's stopping you? Is it guilt? Is it shame? Maybe you just think it's too easy. It's, it's too good to be true. Maybe it's unbelief. He says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean. The blood of the sacrifice was, was the priest would sprinkle the blood on the altar. Jesus sprinkled his blood on our hearts. He has made us clean. He has made you pure. Our bodies washed. The priests had to wash their hands and their feet in order to per, uh, do their priestly offerings. They would make themselves clean by their own hands. We are made clean by the work of Christ. It is a gift. Now we have direct access to God. Not once a year, not once a day, but every moment we have direct access to God. Years ago, I was, before I was a pastor, I was in the high-tech industry. I was a defense contractor and I worked out at uh, what was then called Falcon Air Force Base, which is now Schriever. Uh, and the, I don't know what the security stuff is like now, but when I was there, the way we would get in uh, is we, you'd have to walk up to these, these like they were phone booths, kind of. And so you'd uh, swipe your card and the door would open and you'd step into this, this booth and the door would close. I'm a bit claustrophobic. So the, the, the idea of this thing, I, I'm hoping one of these doors is going to open again, but, but then uh, you're in this, this little booth and it would weigh you. I'm serious. And then you would look into this thing and it would scan the retina in your eyes. And if everything matched up, the other door would open and you would have access into the facility. If you have placed your faith in the finished work of Christ, you have the right credentials. You have access into the throne room of God. You can come directly to God, not because of anything you've done, but because of what Christ has done for you. Now, we have an opportunity to come before God in praise, adoration, and prayer. On July 12th, we will have a night of worship and prayer. And I encourage you guys to put this on your calendar. July 12th, at 6.30, right here in this Rock Remnant Auditorium, a night of worship and prayer. Now, the writer has encouraged us to draw near, and now, now he encourages us. He says, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Hope is the main theme of the book of Hebrews. These people have come out of a sacrificial system for generations, but these sacrifices could never take away sin. And the point of Hebrews is that the ultimate high priest has offered the 
ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate holy of holies. It is finished. It is done. They are completed. There is no need for these sacrifices to go on and on. There is hope. Hebrews is a book of hope. And he tells us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Our confession is a confession of hope. We gather as people to raise our voices in praise. It's a corporate confession of hope. And we are people of hope. And we get to come together side by side to sing of that hope. And he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. The Hebrews that this letter was written to were wavering. Because they were being rejected by their own very own people because they'd walked away from the sacrificial system and were embracing this new Messiah. But what if it wasn't true? What if it's not real? And they were wavering. They were questioning. When we gather, we spend time in God's word. It keeps us from wavering. It gives us direction. It helps us to hold fast. And he says, for he who promised is faithful. Our God has promised us eternal life and unfailing presence. It's a promise from God. Our hope is based on the promises of an unwavering, faithful God. The one who says he will never leave you nor forsake you is faithful. So why would we not gather? We've come together to share our hope. We enter in with each other to learn about a faithful God who keeps us from wavering. Why would we not gather? When I was getting ready to preach this message, I was looking back at at some of my notes and I startled to realize something. Uh, Five years ago, I stood right here and I preached Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Didn't even realize that connection. And, and who knows, maybe five years from now, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to finish Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> but during that message, I told you that we were getting ready in faith to launch a new campus in the southwest part of our city. And the one who promised is faithful. This August, we are going to celebrate our five-year anniversary. And we're going to have a party. We have close to 300 adults and kids that are showing up on on an average weekend. We started with a humble kids ministry, and now now we're, uh, we're running close to 60 kids most weekends. And we've had a minor population explosion, lots of babies all of a sudden. Last fall, we launched our middle school and high school ministry. And in May, we hired a permanent student director to oversee 5th through 12th grade. And this fall, this is a secret, I haven't told Josh this yet. This fall, we are hoping to launch a live Spanish translation to be able to reach the Hispanic community down in that area of our town. God has and working. Now, we don't have the big stage and, and we don't have the, the large band. In fact, our chairs aren't even that comfortable. But the people who come to us are looking for a place where they can be known, a place where they can be vulnerable, where they can be seen. And God is transforming lives. Let me tell you just about one Uh, A woman named Kate had uh, recently come over straight from China with her young son. Her young son didn't speak English, and she wanted to get him around kids that are speaking English. And so uh, it was summer. She couldn't get him in school, so she started looking around online and found out that that Woodman, not too far from her, is having a summer day camp. And so uh, she signed him up for that. And then Nicole, our, our kids coordinator, gave her a call, invited her to come on the weekend. She wasn't interested in coming to church. She just wanted her son to come to summer day camp. But she decided to come and check it out. So she came, and uh, 
she was very nervous, you could tell. She's nervous to be there. She didn't know any of this foreign stuff. And so I started talking to her, and she, she said something that kind of startled me. She said, uh, I, I really want to know about this Jesus that, that you talk about. And so I invited her to come into the auditorium, and, and she's like, no, I, I don't want to go to church. I said, just you and I, we'll just go in the stand in the back and, and just watch for a little while, just so you can kind of see what, what we do here. And so we went down there, and, and it was during the, the worship time that she stood at the back and, and listened. And then after the music finished, there was a video that, that rolled, and she was watching, really uh, transfixed by this video. And then, and then Josh got up, and she started listening. And, and then a little while, we walked out of the auditorium, and, and as we're leaving, she said, she said, that was very moving. Kate... Her son is very good at English now. But even more than that, Kate has placed her faith in Jesus Christ. And she has entered eternal life right now in this life. And Tuesday, this past Tuesday, Kate left for China to see her dad who is very sick. And this may be the last time that she spends with him. And she asked me to pray for her because she said, I want to tell my dad about Jesus and so if you think about it, pray for Kate. God calls us to hold fast. But how do we hold fast in isolation? Several couples that I, I love dearly have recently gone through the devastating heartbreak of losing a baby. Who sits with you in the middle of your grief? if you live in isolation, if you're not part of a gathering. When the doctor says the words that you never wanted to hear. When the one you love looks you in the eyes and tells you they no longer love you. When you just can't take another step. Who holds your hand? Who sits with you? If you're not in the gathering of people. It's your community. We gather to do life, to lift one another up. The writer of Hebrews has encouraged us to draw near, to hold fast, and now he invites us. He says, let us stir up. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That stir up means to provoke, but not provoke to anger, to provoke to action. We are called to stir up, to provoke each other to two things, to love and to good works. And neither of those are natural. It's just not our natural bent. As human, humans, we don't gravitate, first of all, to love or to good works. They're unnatural. And he calls us to stir one another up to that. Recently, Melissa and I went camping with, with a number of people and some of these people we just met that, that, on that trip, and some we'd known for decades. And one night we ended up around this campfire, uh, and it just so happened that evening, everyone around the campfire uh, were married couples. And so somebody asked the question. They said, I just want to hear from other people, because my wife and I kind of go through this. What, what is that one thing that you argue about that you never quite resolve, that you just keep coming back to? And the, we started going around one by one answering that question. And it was very insightful. But I was, I was a little tense because the, I was hoping that the, it would go around this direction on the circle. Or no, this direction because my wife was right here. See, that way it would come to her. She could answer first and I could say, that's it. But the problem is it went around this way. And, and I answered about the thing. And uh, apparently it wasn't the thing. And so then, <laughs> then later we, we had a discussion about what it is that we, we, a recurring argument that we have. But it was during that time going around, hearing those couples, talking with those couples, that we were stirring each other up to love and to good works. Who helps you hold fast? We gather to do life together. He says, not, neglect, not neglecting to meet together as is a habit of some. We are directly told not to walk away from gathering. He says, but encouraging one another. Again, that key word, but. He says, but 
encouraging one another. It shows contrast. The writer is contrasting two things, neglecting to meet together and encouraging one another. When we walk away from gathering, we walk away from encouraging one another. Do, do we really want to do that? Encouragement happens in community. And he says, as you see the day drawing near. A day is coming when Jesus Christ will return. We will be in his presence. We will spend eternity with him. But there are those in our lives that will not be spending eternity with him. As that day draws near, our community together becomes more and more important. There should be a sense of urgency to our gathering. We've been encouraged in this section to do three things. Three things that happen not in isolation, but in community and gathering together. He's encouraged us to draw near to God, to draw near. Jesus has opened a way to come directly before God. He has sprinkled our hearts clean. The ball is in our court. Are you willing to draw near to him? And he calls us to hold fast to our hope without wavering. The one who created you and loves you is faithful. He will never walk away, even if you do. And he calls us to stir one another up to love and good works. And this is our calling. When we gather, it's not simply a social event. It's a responsibility to call one another to love, a duty to stir one another to good works. In a culture that's driven to isolation, let's be counter-cultural. In fact, let's gather as if our life depends on it, because it does. Let's pray. Father, it's such a privilege that we have to be able to, to come together, to be able to gather as the people of God, to gather together to worship you, to praise you, to learn who you are, Father, so that we can hold fast, to come together to stir one another up, to love and good works. Father, it's it's an incredible responsibility, and yet so oftentimes we take it so lightly. Lord, you are the one who calls us to this. In fact, you very clearly tell us to not forsake the gathering together as is a habit of some, that we should come together, that we should encourage one another. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be people who who would long for you, who would long to know you, to praise you, and then because of that, that we would long to encourage those around us because of who you are and the hope that we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. out together. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great Pour
Indeed, he's great. As Kevin pointed out, we gather because we need God and we need people. It doesn't change any day. That's true every day. In fact, before you leave, I don't know who you came with or if you're sitting near somebody you don't know, tell them thank you for being here. Because together we're here to learn and to worship and to acknowledge that it is God who we need and God who's sufficient. And he grants us the ability and the opportunity to gather as a community. If we can pray for you, lift up a need, thank God with you, we'll have pastors and leaders up front as we finish. But before you go into this week, let me read this over you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.